Hey, good afternoon, everyone. We appreciate you joining us uh, this evening for our webinar, the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019, an introduction in 2021 update. I'm Dave Duffus. I'm a partner at HKA Global uh, here in Pittsburgh, and I'm also the president of the TMA Pittsburgh chapter. Uh, additionally, tonight I have the pleasure of serving as the moderator for our program. Uh, I wanna just take a minute before we jump into our program to thank our annual sponsors. Uh, we certainly would not be here without their generosity. And it's only because of them that programming like this is possible. Uh, as I'm talking, you'll see their logos on the screen. Uh, if you're interested in becoming a sponsor, please let me know or reach out to Michael Whitfield, who's the Director of Business Development for TMA Pittsburgh. Um, we have many more exciting virtual events on the horizon and fingers crossed uh, we'll be returning to some in-person events uh, very soon. So we'd love to have everybody who's on tonight uh, join us. Uh, I'm going to take a real quick second to introduce our panel tonight. Uh, I would guess that most, if not all of us uh, on the webinar know who they are. And so I will uh, forego uh, the bios and as we uh, get into the presentation, I'll let them uh, fill you in on, on who they are and their background to the extent you don't know them. So uh, initially, um, we have the uh, Honorable uh, Judy Fitzgerald, uh, retired judge uh, from the Bankruptcy Court here in the Western District, who's now a shareholder at Tucker Ahrensburg. Uh, Bill Krieger, who's a Vice President and Managing Director at Gleason Experts, and Beverly Weissman, who's a shareholder at Tucker Ahrensburg. Uh, we've decided as we go through the program today that we'll deal with questions uh, as they uh, kind of come up. Uh, and so uh, periodically I will jump in and, and uh, uh, try to clear what's in. So please type your questions into the Q&A function and they'll be uh, answered throughout. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our panel uh, for what I think is going to be a really informative program tonight. Hello, everybody. I'm Beverly Weissman, as we were just introduced, and we're pleased to be able to talk with everyone this evening about the Small Business Reorganization Act of 2019. Uh, I'm, we're also pleased that uh, Bill Krieger could join us because Bill is one of the panel trustees in this district. Um, we're going to start, we have some slides which will be available after the program to people upon request. So I'm going to try to share my screen. If I'm unsuccessful, we're going to have Judge Fitzgerald share her screen. So um, hold on for one moment as we introduce this. Uh, okay. All right. So as you can see, can if hopefully you can see the uh, screen and you can see our slides and hopefully my fellow panelists will nod if they're seeing it. Um, we're going to talk about the Small Business Reorganization Act and it is part of Chapter 11. And Chapter 11 is governed obviously by 11 U.S. Code enacted in 1978. It was effective in 1979. For some of us that seems like just like it was just yesterday. Um, but here it is many, many, many years later, and people have decided it's just too expensive. And so we're in the situation where people were like, oh, this is too expensive, people aren't using it. So they got themselves together and Congress finally came up with a, an alternative, which was basically the, sorry about that, which was basically the new SBRA Act. Uh, Congress and looking at it in 2019 said, look, you know, we need the small p businesses to be able to, the startups, uh, all these folks need to be able to go in and they just weren't. Uh, if we've all, all of us have been involved in chapter 11s know that they're costly, they take a long time. And one of the things I, we learned early on was because everything is done on notice and a hearing, 
it's expensive. That means you have to file a motion. You have to have a notice out. You have to have a hearing, which also increases the cost significantly. Chapter 11s were also pretty expensive because not only is a debtor paying for itself, it's paying for a committee lawyer. It's paying fees. And it just wasn't working. So basically, they passed the Small Business, uh, um, the Small Business Act, and it went into effect last year. Uh, conforming amendments were made and the four interim rules adopted by the bankruptcy court. Uh, we have a, a site to those if you haven't seen them yet, but it's at the uscourts.gov. Uh, the national forms have also been modified. They, they had promulgated new forms, they had promulgated interim rules. Those have all been adopted as well. And you can see the links to those particular aspects of the plan. Now, in our district, the courts formed a committee to study the amendments, to study the new provisions, and to come up with a plan ourselves. And after many, many meetings, it seemed like many, many meetings, for a, a committee with a cross-section of practitioners across the board, we adopted, we came up with a plan uh, based upon plans in other districts, but based upon what our collective experience in the Western District was. And that was plan was adopted. The link to it is uscourts.gov and it's per an order. On November 30th, they adopted the local form and you must use that form when you're as the form for your plan. I suppose you can get court permission, but the local rules provide that that form must be used. Additionally, the Western District bankruptcy court is putting together rules uh, in addition to the interim rules to govern this chapter. Um, so basically this chapter was there, but it wasn't put into place because of COVID. But what happened once it was in place was COVID came around and all of a sudden people were in deep, deep trouble. And as part of the uh, response of Congress to the COVID crisis, they enacted what was called the Coronavirus Aid Relief and Economic Security Act known as the CARES Act. They changed the definition of the small business debtor to increase the amount of the debt ceiling to be $7.5 million. Now that was a pretty significant change because prior to that, the total aggregate secured and unsecured debts had to be 2.725625 subject to adjustment. These amendments, by the way, terminate. Uh, they were going to terminate this March, but recently legislation was enacted. So now they're terminating next March. All right. So the impact of the CARES Act was the debt ceilings increased. And statistically, you are seeing as a result of this increased debt ceiling and the ease with which people are able to deal with a Chapter 11, uh, more filings. Uh, so um, over 1,760 uh, SBRA cases were filed between January 2020 and March 31st, 2021. And that's a lot of cases given the number of debtors. And in fact, I think they anticipate more will be done. I think Bill has some statistics he could share with us as well as to recent filings in our district. Uh, sure. Uh, so I talked earlier today with the US trustee with the most updated numbers in terms of cases that have been filed in the district. And so far we have 19 total uh, that have been filed. Uh, of those, 18 were filed directly as subchapter fives, and one was then redesignated from a chapter 11 into subchapter five. Um, and so, I don't know what happened there. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how many we have at this point. Um, you know, in, uh, we can later on. I can give you some more statistics in terms of those that were were confirmed. But in terms of the filings themselves. Uh, 11 different firms have filed those cases. Um, uh, while there are two firms that have about 10 of the 19 cases, uh, the rest were all filed, you know, one, one by one from other firms. And just to give you a sense for the type of companies that are falling into 
subchapter five. I'll just go through a, a list of some of the the industries. You know, engine repair companies, a restaurant, a golf center, a uh, gauge manufacturer, a bar, a hairdressing uh, company, a chain of coffee shops, a drilling company, trucking company, um, a church, law firm, medical practice, excavating company, an interior designer. Um, and of those, all of those cases, four were um, filed by individuals. So I'll give you a sense in terms of what's going on uh, here in this district. And as Ben mentioned earlier about the increase in the, the debt ceiling that covers subchapter five, of the cases that were filed, three of them uh, were filed or able to be filed because of the change in the, um, the, the debt limit from roughly 2.7 to seven and a half million dollars. Right, so basically the critical aspect as we, we're seeing across the country and why we expect to see more SBR cases is the ABI reported that subchapter five cases are also experiencing higher plan confirmation rates speeder plan confirmation, more consensual plans, which was the whole point that we'll talk about, and improved cost effectiveness, uh, more so than had those cases been filed as the traditional chapter 11. In fact, I've got a number of matters to bill that you'll be seeing as well, where I'm representing the creditor and the debtor was just waiting to have its PPP loans forgiven before they start filing their subchapter five case. And I think we're going to start seeing a lot more cases coming into our district as well. Uh, Bev, I would just add, I would just add that since June, uh, we've had 34 chapter 11 or 34 chapter 11 cases that have been filed of which half of those were sub chapter fives. Yeah. So that's pretty significant. And it's really very significant in a district well, such as the Western district where many of the cases are not what we would call mega cases. Um, so when we're gonna talk about the benefits of the SBRA versus the chapter 11 considerations, um, and I'm happy to have everyone pitch in, but everyone has seen and heard about what the benefits are, but basically what it comes down to that there are real cost savings. Uh, first of all, you still, when you file, stay in possession as the debtor, you still operate your business. Uh, one biggie is if you are a small business debtor and you owe your attorney some money from helping you out and doing the filing, if they're as long as they're owed $10,000 or less, they can still be your lawyer. They won't be considered to be disinterested. And that's, that's a benefit to counsel because you know, your client gets into trouble and they owe you four or 5,000 bucks and all of a sudden you have to forgive it if you want to be their lawyer. So that's a big change. Uh, you're no longer considered not disinterested just by virtue of the fact that you're owed under $10,000. The biggie is there's no creditors committee unless ordered by the court. So that's both good and bad for attorneys, right? You know, and professionals. That means there's not going to be a committee. There's not going to be a committee council, there's not going to be professionals for the committee, but it can, a case can have uh, a committee if upon motion to the court and cause the court says, yeah, I think this is the type of case, even though it's a small business case, maybe it should have a creditor's committee. There are no quarterly U.S. trustee fees, and I think we all know that one of the biggest complaints anyone ever heard was the U.S. trustee fees can be pretty significant because they're on all receipts that a debtor might come in. So those are gone. There's also some preference reform, which should make creditors happier and more inclined to work with the debtor towards a plan. And finally, when you're looking at the plan itself, only the debtor can file a plan. None of this exclusivity, fighting them, crying like that. Um, you don't have to, there's not a separate uh, disclosure statement requirement anymore for the most part. Uh, if a court decides that it wants a separate disclosure statement, then you have to comply with the provisions. But the local form that we have enacted in this district is sufficiently has sufficient information 
that using that form was designed to give people adequate information to enable them to determine whether this was the kind of plan they wanted to vote in favor of. The plan can provide for payments to creditors over three to five years, similar to a chapter 13. The SBRA trustee will collect and distribute the payments to creditors. Uh, the SBR trustees fees are paid uh, based upon their hourly billable rates. And this is an area, and Bill can probably weigh in, that I think a lot of people think, well, is this like a chapter 13? Am I paying a commission or a chapter 12 based upon my payments? But as Bill assures us, no, he will file his uh, fee schedule when he's selected and he bills on an hourly basis. Hey, Bill, are you paid at to the same time payments under a plan are pay made? You're on, mute. You're on mute. About that. Uh, thanks, Judy. Uh, it depends on it depends really on the plan. Um, certainly, my preference would be you know to be paid uh, you know upon uh, confirmation and and uh, effectiveness of the plan. Um, but there may be some situations. I don't have it any of my cases at this point where. Um, the trustee payments would have to occur over the three to five time year period of the uh, of the plan from disposable income. Um, but so far, so good in terms of the cases that I'm involved in. Right. And that brings us back to the point that administrative claims can be paid over the life of the plan. So it's not just that you're paying bill over the life of the plan or your lawyers can now be paid over the life of the plan, but other administrative expense claims such as, you know, deferred rent, uh, payments to your creditors who were uh, have claims for post-petition services. Those don't have to be paid on confirmation. They can be paid over the life of the plan. And I think that significantly helps a lot of these smaller businesses with liquidity and the ability to get the reorganization underway. Um, so the one other larger change is there is a provision which allows individuals where they're claims are, were secured by mortgages on the debtor's principal residence to modify that mortgage. That's a big change from existing chapter 11. Uh, and I suspect we'll have it utilized a lot more here because a lot, of, a lot of small business owners give mortgages to secure their debt and they mortgage their homes. And under chapter 11, traditional chapter 11, the courts were saying you could not modify that mortgage under a plan, right? And to me, one biggie also is the court can confirm a plan even if all classes don't vote in favor of the plan. Under the old chapter 11 process, you had to have at least one class, one impaired class voting in favor of the plan to get it confirmed. That requirement is gone. And that will open up a lot of ease in trying to get a plan confirmed. So eligibility, if, Jude, do you if, want to- If I could just add a couple things, uh, oh, if I ahead. could just add something on, on this in terms of um, being successful at plan time and, and, and what makes cases work uh, the best, just to give you a perspective of how quickly these things move. On the filing date plus one day, the trustee gets appointed, filing day, uh, plus a week, the IDI, the initial debtor interview takes place. Uh, certainly within 30 days, the 341 meeting uh, takes place. Your first status conference is 60 days out and 14 days prior to that, you have to file your status report with the court. And then at 90 days, the plan is due. So things move very, very quickly. And it's important uh, to have your client situation kind of figured out and under control before filing. So have, a, have an idea of what your plan is going to look like. Um, successful cases that I've been involved with, you know, the, the debtor's attorneys had a, a very good sense going in to bankruptcy as to how they were going to get to a consensual plan. My most important suggestion would be have your financial reporting and tax issues um, worked out or at least well on the way to being worked out before filing date. So two of my cases that I have currently are really stagnant and will likely require plan extensions because the debtors have multiple years of tax returns outstanding. And so until we can get those tax returns done and in some of these cases get some financial information, can't really even begin the process of working toward 
a consensual plan. So, you know, that information, having that, you know, resolved going in, having your schedules done at filing, these are all important things to have in mind before you file the case so that it can move through the system. And at some point we'll talk about the extensions, but um, while, while, you can, while you can try to get an extension, the court doesn't exactly, uh, and the judges uh, in general, don't, don't exactly look well on um, plan extensions. And we can talk a little bit more about that later on. So when we talk about, and thank you, uh, certainly it is true that it moves quickly. And one of the reasons I think our district wanted to have a form plan available was because they were gonna move quickly. So if you're thinking of filing a subchapter five for your client, you can get that form plan and look at it and have the information you need in advance. But when we're talking about eligibility, here's our next question. Who is eligible? Judge Fitzgerald, can, we know the $7.5 million debt threshold is out there. Uh, what else can you tell us about eligibility with respect to being able to file a subchapter five? Well, the subchapter five provisions for eligibility um, are not located in the typical place that you'd expect them. They are in section 1182, part of the SBRA itself. And the primary one that is getting a lot of play in the case law right now is the very first, that a person has to be engaged in commercial or business activities. Um, and that includes an affiliated chapter 11 debtor, if in fact there are any in these cases. And everybody will remember that person includes both individuals, people, and entities. And as a result, um, the statute, in my view, seems to be more directed toward looking at commercial ac activities than it does individual people, but nonetheless, people are eligible to file under the SBRA. Um, Beverly has already told you that the debt limit is now aggregate, non-contingent, liquidated combination of secured and unsecured claims in an amount that does not exceed $7,500,000 um, if you've got a debtor who's pushing the limits, you may want to try to get them in before March 27th of next year, because that is when the current debt limit will expire and I guess revert to the 2 million seven blah, 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 um, that was in place before the 7,500. The other eligibility requirement is that at least 50% of the debt that the debtor has comes from the commercial or business activities of the debtor. There is also a debate in the case law right now about whether that means the commercial or business activities of the debtor that led to the filing, or whether it means all of the debtor's commercial or business activities. So I think there's room for litigation to uh, perhaps just get some clarity on that uh, element as time goes by. But wait, Bev, you went too fast. Sorry. <laughs> the statute also provides for those who are not eligible. And this is equally as important as those who are eligible, particularly the first one, which is that a debtor whose primary business activity is owning, not no, no to the word is owning, not owning and operating, not operating, just owning, single asset real estate businesses are ex explicitly excluded from eligibility. Businesses um, that are publicly traded are excluded and a business that's an affiliated insurer of a publicly traded company is also excluded. And before I get into the next um, provision, I wanna give everybody a heads up because I've been thinking about this and I've asked a couple judges who are handling these cases, what they think about it. And really no one's come up with an answer yet. And that has to go back to the point um, Beverly made earlier, which is that there are no US trustee fees payable as the result of a subchapter five filing. So that means that the, the Department of Justice's traditional resources are being used to support the US trustees program to have all of these cases come through the system. And the expectation is that subchapter five cases will uh, sort of be a zenith 
in the in this chapter 11 world because for those entities that are eligible and have prepared for the filing as bill was talking about um, earlier really can get through the system in a lot less expensive and timely fashion um, but the question is how is the u.s trustee's office going to continue to supervise these cases when there is no money coming in from the cases themselves to to provide for that supervision. At the moment, there aren't so many that it's been a problem. But if in fact the floodgates open, as is the expectation, I just wonder what's going to happen and how long it's going to take Congress to impose a fee. So just a heads up, while there is no fee, maybe another good time to try to file these cases because I'm just not um, totally convinced that there won't be some kind of a, of a tax, taxation at some point. Okay, Bev, if you'd change the slide, please. Okay, so I uh, mentioned that the current dispute in the case law really is, what does it mean to be engaged in a business or commercial activity? The first cases out the door that looked at this issue had individual debtors. And as a result, I think the prescription for filing was judged a bit differently than when the, case, the debtor is an entity that actually is the business. The problem that debtors who are individual space is they are not the business or the commercial activity. They're sort of a, they're engaged in, in it maybe, um, but nonetheless, they are not it. So it, there is a difference I think in looking at cases where you've got a guarantor of a debt is a guarantee of a commercial debt a business activity? I think you can make an argument that it's at least a commercial activity because without that guarantee, the business likely wouldn't have um, been able to get the loan that enabled the business to undertake its activity. But uh, that's still an open question. It hasn't been adjudicated um, that I know of as yet. The issue also is whether you have to be actually engaged in the business, that is, you know, your doors have to be open and customers walking in or suppliers walking out um, on the day you file. And there is, again, a, de a debate in the literature about whether you must be open for business on that filing date. I think the cases are starting to center around the idea that you do not actually have to have your doors open for business on the filing date, provided that you actually are engaged in doing something. So for example, a recent case that just came down a couple days ago um, was talking about the fact that there is a, a business uh, that closed its doors. I'm talking about the offer space case um, at the moment, business that closed its doors pre-petition and the owner of the business was engaged in wind-up activities those wind-up activities were still ongoing, even though the business itself was closed. And the court determined that that was enough of a commercial or business activity to enable the debtor to be in a subchapter five, even though it was liquidating, its doors were closed, and it wasn't conducting any actual business at the time and had no intention of ever going back into business again. That seems to be the, the trend um, as to where ca the cases are headed uh, at the moment. Um, there's just a point on this slide about uh, where a corporation was an issuer, that is a, a, an issuer whose stock was publicly traded, uh, was an affiliate of the debtor. That made the debtor ineligible to file be under subchapter five because that affiliate that was the issuer owned more than 20% of the debtors voting securities. It's the only case I've seen on point um, that talks about that, but nonetheless, it's out there and something to be remembered. So take a look at section 1182 before you file to make sure that the debtor hits the eligibility uh, requirements. Do, do we I was just gonna add, oh, I'm sorry. There, there's a case in front of Judge Deller currently that Crystal, Thornton Illar is the trustee on where the issues as to whether the debtor is a commercial entity and business is, is at issue. The U.S. trustee has, has filed to say it's not qualified for subchapter five. Um, 
just one comment that the judge made, um, and, and again, it's not my case, but I was uh, you know, waiting uh, um, for a status conference, but he, he indicated that um, you know, he certainly followed the law in terms of those things, but was a bit curious as to you know, why the US trustee was um, filing to have it taken out of subchapter five when um, they don't get it, fees. It, it I, know the answer to, I know yeah. the answer to that. They don't get any fees in the subchapter five. So they don't want the cases there. It's, it's been the U.S. trustee. I would trustee. never say that out loud. Come on. It's been the U.S. trustee that has raised the objection, I think, in all of these cases. Of course. Um, well, yeah. well, all but one. In one case, it actually was a creditor who raised the issue. But for the most part, it's the U.S. trustee. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I we don't want the U.S. trustees program to go bankrupt necessarily. So, you know, if the government can't file, so we may have an issue there. Right. All right so he's, had, he's right. having them brief, brief the issue now. And so we'll see how it goes here in this district. And this is an interesting this topic because unless an objection is raised, if a debtor does say, hey, I'm eligible, is anyone really checking those schedules to see that they're eligible and who would check except the US trustee's office? Uh, because a lot of times maybe you're a creditor and you're thinking, boy, I, I'd rather be in a, this kind of case which moves quickly. Well, so, I think I, I had a case. the same oh, issue sorry, is in the, I'm sorry. It's the same issue as in the chapter 13s. I mean, many times debtors are ineligible because their debt exceeds the limit. But if no one's objecting, it's kind of uh, like, who cares? I'd much rather have a trustee overseeing um, the debtor to the extent that the trustee is responsible for taking action than have my client bear the expense of undertaking those actions. And so if I can fit somebody within a case where there is a trustee taking a look at things, I, I as, a, as a representative of a client, would much prefer that activity, but I should point out that it is the debtor's burden to substantiate eligibility. So if there is an objection, it's the debtor's burden to prove that the debtor is eligible. I'm sorry, Bill, I, I cut you off. I was just gonna say, I had, I had one of my cases that was actually confirmed um, was, was flirting with the single asset real estate um, issue. And uh, while I expected that at some point somebody would raise the question, um, yeah, ultimately it wasn't. And, and fortunately so, because we, I was able to work with debtors council to get to a confirmed plan. Well, you know, within the, the, um, deadlines. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I consider that a success. Right. So, and, and I think, um, there are a lot of times from the creditor's perspective, he would rather have that debtor in a chapter 11 and get it done and, uh, move it forward. So eligibility, interesting point, but it's really going to be the question of how, who does it, when, and why. Uh, and the fact that if you're not eligible, it just boots you into a regular chap chapter 11. So it's not like they dismiss your case. They just find you're not eligible and make you be a regular chapter 11 debtor. Or convert. I mean, the cases can convert and the chapter, mm -hmm. subchapter five trustee can in some instances become, put the debtor out of possession and become the operator of the business or the entity that's going to do the liquidation as well. So you're not totally free from all supervision as a debtor in possession in subchapter five, but as Bill will talk about in a little bit, his duties are more restricted as a subchapter five trustee than, um, than, a, than a regular uh, trustee would be in a chapter seven. So. <laughs> Yeah, what about um, the mechanics? Tell us a little bit about the mechanics. So when you go it, when you do when the, the lawyer does the filing, just like before, you have to actually elect. When you file your petition, you have to elect to be a subchapter five uh, case. All right. So you actually and the form is on there, on there, and there is a specific form. They've been modified. So when you go in and download the forms, you can see that particular one. And the election is now actually set forth in line 13 for the individual petition and line eight of the petition for non-individuals. Why are we pointing out that little minutia? Because quite frankly, when I was looking, I'm like, where, where the heck is that? Where do you do that? Um, so you have to elect. And if you fail to elect, it's just going to be a regular uh, chapter 11. 
In an involuntary case, a debtor has 14 days to file a statement of whether or not they want to elect to an SBRA case. And the official forms, as I mentioned, were modified to change the, uh, all of the provisions relative to the CARE Act. Um, so when the debtor files their petition, and this goes back to the point that Bill made, you have to attach to your petition your most recent balance sheet, your statement of operations, a cash flow statement, and your federal income tax return. Right? If those aren't available, and we do know that sometimes you have a lot of debtors, and I remember when I had a lot of farm debtors, everything was in a, 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 a milk basket in, in the barn, all the receipts and things. But if they're not available, then the debtor has to file a statement under penalty of perjury that those balance sheets and statement of operations aren't around. Uh, it seems somewhat incredulous that someone could be in business and not have these, but on an individual side, you could understand potentially that a person may just simply have a credit application or a personal financial statement and they have not been preparing uh, balance sheets or statements of operations. But on the business side, if it's a corporation or an LLC, that would come as somewhat of a surprise to me. Hey, but I've been surprised before. Bill, are you seeing these documents being filed? Yes, right I now? have. I, uh, yeah, yes, the, the, a lot of the filings have most of the schedules prepared at that time or shortly um, submitted um, within days of, of the filing. I do unfortunately have one case where that the attestation of the unavailability of financial information was made. And um, as a result, this is a case that is not moving very quickly now because there's just not financial information to even begin to formulate mentally what a consensual plan might look like. Right, so, but how is that different than what we see now? That's my little joke about that issue. We have that happen all the time. Um, now, trustees in our district obviously include Bill. Uh, they include uh, Jim Felton. They include Crystal thornton Aller, And for Erie cases, John miller Um So, uh, Bill, can you, will they put you on the wheel for an Erie case, however? Well, let, let's talk about that briefly. So, you know, my understanding was that John was going to end up picking up a lot of Erie cases. But at this point, we only had one case filed in Erie. So, he is active on the Pittsburgh wheel at this point in terms of the assignment of cases. And in terms of how cases get assigned, it's the, the typical thing on a rotating basis, though. The uh, U.S. trustee um, on occasion will identify specific issues with the case, let's say lack of financial information, and decide to assign somebody that's got a little bit more of a financial background rather than a legal background to that case. Or... For example, I have uh, a background in healthcare, and so we had a healthcare uh, case, a physician practice case, and the U.S. trustee thought it would be better to assign me to that. So, of the of the 19 cases that have been filed this this at this point in the district, seven have been assigned to me, which you know doesn't mean anything other than um, they're going to make that up as new cases get filed. I probably won't won't get any until things even out amongst the four trustees. I don't know, Bill. I think it's just because everybody loves you so much. <laughs> so, and, well, and, don't forget you have to go through the conflicts checks too. So that's well, that's true test. too. And and a, and a good example is that Crystal filed the Ed's Beans or Crazy Mocha case, and she was next up for assignment to the case, and she was conflicted out, and that's how I ended up with that case. Right. And so, Judy, I know that in many instances we're hearing that the judges are pretty happy about the nature of the trustees being selected. Um, what have you heard from judges across the country about uh, the happiness or the, the satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the nature of subchapter five trustees? What I've been hearing generally is that the um, judges are very satisfied with what's going on. Um, it's, it isn't necessarily even so much a personality thing. It's a duty thing. Um, they're very happy about the fact that there is an independent person who's getting early information, taking a look at what the debtor is actually doing, and in essence, kind of mediating between the parties to make sure that the case is on track for, if possible at all, a consensual resolution. 
even in a subchapter five case, a consensual resolution provides better re uh, remedies for a debtor because of the way the discharge is entered, which uh, we may get to later. Um, and if we don't, you should look to see. And so if you can get a consensual case and plan confirmed, it's better for everyone. And the judges appreciate that, um, the fact that the subchapter five trustees are really exercising that role. So Jude, really quickly, you wanna let us t talk about what some of the statutory duties are of the trustee and, or do, are we gonna have you do that, Bill? Bill, why don't you explain? So section 1183 sets forth the trustee's statutory duties. and. You're, you're, you're in there sort of like the chapter 13 trustee in a way, you're not operating, all right? And you're not filing the financials, the DIP reports, which have to be filed. Uh, what, do, what are your duties? How do these work? What is he doing? That's yeah. always a question that I get. <laughs> How are you on EFT? <laughs> I, I think the number one responsibility of the trustee um, and, and where I have spent the vast majority of my time is really working with debtors counsel and creditors in trying to put together a consensual plan. So it's not uncommon for us to have conversations um, with both debtor and creditors um, or each individually um, in an effort to try to understand what everybody's positions are. And then a lot of what I'm doing too is once the plan is starting to come together, at least we have a concept conceptual plan, is work with debtors counsel in formulating the plan, actually writing the plan and looking and, you know, preparing the financial forecasts that are a required part of the plan. And so the plan, uh, the, the cases that I think have been most successful are those cases where um, I'm working directly with debtors counsel um, and reviewing and working with them on the plan before it's filed so that when it gets filed, there are no issues. In the only, you know, in one of the only cases where that didn't occur. Um, I actually, unfortunately, had to file an objection to the plan as trustee, which is one of the, the, the abilities and responsibilities of the trustee. Um, and, and, and it was really a debate and, and one that I consulted with other trustees and the U.S. trustee about as to whether it was appropriate for me to do it. And at the end of the day, it came down to, um, I didn't want to be sitting in front of Judge Tedonio uh, at the confirmation hearing with him asking, as everyone understands he um, tends to do, asking very detailed questions about how the plan is formulated and the financial issues associated with it and have him turn to me and say, where were you? And so as a result, I filed the objection, the idea really to correct some technical issues as, as it relates to the plan in terms of actually following the plan outline, but more so in terms of disclosures that were in the plan of a financial nature and how the for financial forecasts of future disposable income were being constructed. Now, fortunately for us, the, you know, the, the judge agreed um, at that point and uh, debtors council agreed to amend the plan. And while we were preparing the amendment, we worked directly with each other through several iterations of the plan, got it filed, no objections, Fortunately, actually got a vote from the impaired class that approved the plan, and that plan was just uh, confirmed today. And and Judge Sidonio, you know, pointed out that um, he was um, pleased with with the process in, in terms of that case because it really shows that the subchapter five process is working here in the district. Okay, um, let's. Judy, do you want to, why don't we go into the case management conference, Jude? I know that's a, uh, you know, with respect to the debtor in possession, uh, the debtor stays in possession, the debtor files the reports, not the trustee. Um, is the status conference, but let's talk really briefly as we roll through about the status conference, because I, I would like to hear um, your thoughts about that, Judge Fitzgerald. Uh, the importance of a status conference in these chapter 11 cases. And then Bill, is that working? Because I know that there are so many times that when you're in the early parts of the case, one of the things lawyers wanted, and obviously Congress heard this, was to be able to get in front of the judge and say, hey, look what's going on in this case. So Judge Fitzgerald, thoughts about, is that working? Is that appropriate? What do you think? 
I think without a status conference, especially with as quickly as these cases are moving, the judge is likely to be a bit behind the eight ball. A status conference never hurts to alert the court to the procedural posture, to what types of issues the court's going to have to deal with, um, to talk about what's happening on the business side of the case. Alert, alerting the judge, I think, is always a, a, a good thing. I'm not suggesting that somebody should give up confidential client information, obviously, but to talk about what is actually happening outside the courtroom is usually very helpful. Now, the status conference is different. The, the requirements for a status conference are different under subchapter five than they are in the other chapter 11 cases, because of course, there won't be a disclosure statement in all probability. There won't be a creditor's committee in all probability. The plan is due in 90 days. So the debtor ought to have a pretty good understanding of its business model and how it's going to carry out the terms of the plan by the time it gets to that status conference, which has to happen within 60 days, but usually if they can, will happen a little earlier. That's only 30 days before the plans do. So by then you should have started talking to your creditors and making some deals and doing what chapter 11 lawyers do, which is figuring it all out and getting through the process. Um, so I think it's a good thing, but Bill, you've had the I, I think, experience. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think it's a, a crucial element of making a subchapter five case work. Um, you know, it, it's great to be able, it, it, it pushes the issues forward. It expedites the case by forcing debtors counsel to prepare a status report, appear in court. And I, and I think the judges um, use it as an opportunity to see where the case is going, because not by that time, we may not have enough financial information, and also to remind uh, debtors' counsel and debtors, because they're on the calls uh, as well frequently, remind them that of what their responsibilities are in terms of, of getting to a plan. And so there was a status conference today on, on a case um, where one of the judges you know, made it clear that you know, this was not, you know, the status conference was, was that it wasn't progressing quite at the speed he wanted. And the idea was, you know, it made it clear that there was still an expectation that the plan was going to get filed uh, by the due date. They're very reluctant to give extensions. Um, they have in some of, in some of my cases, and we can talk about that a little bit at some point, but made it clear to debtors counsel that his expectation was, don't file for an extension on the due date of the plan. Instead, file a plan, even if you're, you're not prepared to ask for the confirmation hearing at this point, because it provides a structure um, for negotiations uh, between debtors and creditors and, and allows the judge to see where things are as an update from 30 days from the last status conference as to how things are progressing. I think one other important thing in this regard too is the type of um, monthly financial report that the debtor has to file is simpler in a subchapter five case, but it provides basic information. And it's important to have those reports filed before the status conference, at least in this district, every judge I know reads them. And, um, mm -hmm. and as a result is prepared to ask some pretty tough questions if need be on those reports. So I think, and they're helpful, I believe, for the status conference. I don't know, Bill, if you had any particular problems or experience with those? Certainly had problems in terms of timely filing of monthly operating reports. Um, I will say that the, the judges look at them very closely, especially given how quickly things are moving um, and are, are not hesitant to remind debtors to get that information in because it you know, really forms the foundation for where the case is headed. Okay, well, let's talk, let's skip ahead a little bit. Um, uh, the one thing I've known about property the estate, because this is a plan and it's open and chances are the debtor doesn't get their dis discharge right away if it's not a consensual plan, all of that post-petition property, except as otherwise changed, tends to be pulled into the estate. There are also some important changes with respect to leases and how quickly a debtor must uh, assume or reject the lease and that time frame has been extended uh, recently in conjunction with COVID. But there's a sunset on that additional time frame for a debtor to 
assume or reject a commercial lease, uh, although now they have up to 300 days, which given that you have to have your plan filed in uh, uh, 90 days, you have to wonder what that's all about. But in a, let's talk really briefly, let's skip over some of these other issues and let's talk about the disclosure statement and plan. Uh, we noted that you don't have to have a separate disclosure statement, but what about the plan, Judy? Tell us about what goes, what statutorily is required to be, you know, the plan, what's going on, and then Bill, um, your experience, I, we have the plan, we have the plan in our district. What are the, what does the statute provide for, Jude, and Bill, how does that work logically? Well, section, uh, section 1190, um, talks about the requirements of the plan. And really they're pretty simple. Um, they're not too much different from what you have to do in a normal chapter 11 case, uh, other than the timeframes, which are much shorter. And certainly the uh, standard form plan that the district has adopted lays this all out for you. So you kind of can't go wrong by at least using it as a model, even if for some reason you need to, to ask the court for permission to, to do something different. Um, one thing for sure, the plan requires that payments have to be made in no less than three and no more than five years if there is an objection um, to, to the plan itself. Um, the debtor is permitted to modify non-purchase money mortgages as Beverly already admitted, uh, I'm sorry, it, it not admitted, <laughs> stated. Um, administrative <laughs> expense claims can be paid uh, over the whole life of the plan. They're not required to be paid up front. So in essence, it takes away the administrative insolvency problem that many Chapter 11 debtors face on confirmation where attorney's fees, taxes, something has accrued and can't be paid on the effective date. That doesn't happen now in a subchapter five. There is one caveat though, and that is at least as to secured claims, the debtor has to provide an, an alternative remedy. In the event that the debtor is not able to make all of the plan payments, the debtor has to have a default provision built right into this plan. And that I think is a good thing because it forces the debtors to wonder about what, are, what they're going to do in three years if their business caves or in five years if suddenly the build, building you know, needs a new roof and insurance won't cover it. So uh, there are some differences, but uh, not I think so many that would trouble a chapter 11 lawyer. Um, of course, the plan has to be fair and equitable. All of the debtor's disposable income, which is defined in section 1191 and is essentially the same thing that we think of as disposable income, uh, even without the SBRA, that is, it includes everything but ongoing maintenance for the family, domestic support obligations, and, and necessary expenditures to keep the business going. Um, that has to be committed to the plan for the plan payment period. That's a tough burden. That is where many Chapter 13 debtors lose it over the life of the plan. And I think that may be a problem for some businesses. If they've got a good business model, you know, fair market share, they've got their pricing right, it may not be so uh, awful for them, but it, it's not an easy thing to predict three and five years out. Um, and so the debtor has to demonstrate that it's got a reasonable likelihood of being able to make all of those plan payments. I suppose that's the equivalent of a feasibility analysis. Um, the term, the words aren't the same, but I think the intent is um, somewhat the same. So um, there isn't that much of a difference in what the plan requirements are. One good thing about the plan is that the absolute priority rule doesn't apply any longer. And so equity can keep its um, interest in the debtor without having to worry about going through some sale process or, or something else, putting in additional cash. Uh, so the absolute priority rule is gone, but the provision that requires that you not unfairly discriminate against any creditor still remains. So you still have the classification issues that you had before. They're not quite as threatening to a debtor here though, because as Beverly already mentioned, it doesn't matter whether you get an impaired class to vote for the plan. If the judge thinks that it's confirmable and you can make it work, then the judge can confirm it anyway. So I think that's kind of a quick run through. Bill, anything else that you're seeing um, in the plans? 
Um, you know, my advice is you can't go wrong with the form plan. Um, and I would also suggest that um, if you're considering subchapter five and you're formulating, formulating ideas in terms of a plan, or if you have filed and you're looking to file your plan, take a look at some of the examples of the cases that have been confirmed in the district and, and look at how they have converted what's in the form plan into their actual plan. Um, you know, the judges are looking very closely at both the monthly operating reports and the plan. And, you know, a, a, an issue was raised in a confirmation hearing today as an example as to, you know, what, what's, the, what's the situation. And I was able to point out, which I worked with debtors council on, that there was an equity backstop associated with the plan payments that equity holders who were also employees would take deferral of compensation and who were also the landlord for the business would also take deferral of, of lease payments to ensure that plan payments were made. And I think that satisfied the judge's concern about the um, debtor's ability, which, you know, when you look at the monthly operating reports, we had cash flow losses, but in the plan projections, we showed that, uh, that things would be improving. Part of that is due to COVID, um, uh, but we all, none of us know how long that's going to take, especially for different types of businesses, how long it's going to take to recover. And so with that backstop, he was satisfied and the, the plan got confirmed. Just real quickly in terms of confirmations so far. So we had 19 cases in the district. So far, we've confirmed four. All four were consensual. Four cases were dismissed. Uh, two were redesignated out. And the remaining cases are all still pending. So gives you a sense of at least we're having some success in terms of getting cases confirmed on a consensual basis. So one of the reasons you're so important in your role and the subchapter five trustees role is so important is that you help put a consensual plan together, which is required immediately for that discharge. Um, and I know that uh, Judge Fitzgerald had thoughts about 1141 when you when I read the statute, by the way, it's far from a model of clarity. You know that oh yeah, if you have a consensual plan, you get your discharge under 1141. It certainly says that if you don't have a consensual plan, you get your discharge at the end of the case. Judge Fitzgerald, can you tell us a little bit about the discharge? Well, the discharge essentially relieves the debtor of the personal liability to pay all of the debts that, that are discharged. It does not relieve the property to the extent that there is a security interest or a lien that also serves to pay the debt. So the discharge is a pretty important thing for the debtor. Um, as these practitioners probably know, the normal chapter 11 cases now where individuals file do not provide for the discharge until the end of all plan payments. And I think the SBRA has kind of piggybacked on that to a certain extent. That's also the rule for chapter 13s now. Um, so whether an individual debtor can get into a chapter 11 subchapter five case, get a consensual plan and not have to wait until the end of the, of the case for the discharge is probably an issue that's going to come up in the future. And then we can just really quickly, I think we can uh, go into the generic uh, issue here since we're sort of out of time and to see whether David were there. We have a, uh, a question about. Oh, from, Bill answered that one um, about the filings. Right. So right. But basically the comment that I have heard is that they fully anticipate a full slew of these filings coming in. Um, and you're going to see even more. One of the things is uh, when we talk about the debt limits, I did want to mention the fact that uh, if they're, it's like before, but when you're looking at what you include in your debt limits, you're not necessarily, you're not including uh, unliquidated or contested debt. All right. So you could have a person who has a lot more debt, um, Bill, is it your experience that uh, are the courts allowing someone who has a PPP loan to not include that in the cap? You're on mute, Bill. Mute again. <laughs> Thought we were close to being done. Uh, the cases that I've seen, the PPP loans have been forgiven uh, before coming in. Uh, there was one where um, it was in the process of being forgiven at this point, but it would did not make a difference uh, in terms of staying under the cap or being over the cap. 
But I, I agree with you. I, I think the PPP money at this point has allowed a lot of businesses to survive longer. And when that money runs out, uh, I, I expect that we'll probably see some more filings uh, than we have um, as a result of that. Okay. All right. I think we are concluded with our program. I'll turn it back over to We you. are. Um, so first of all, thanks very much uh, to our panel. I think there was a lot of really uh, good information that we shared uh, on what is a relatively new uh, program here. So uh, thanks uh, for the insight and the information that you were able to share. I know uh, there was a, a fair amount of material that you kind of sped through. So I think it would be great if we could have you guys back uh, again in the future, maybe to cover some of the things uh, that you didn't have an opportunity to cover and maybe even more importantly, um, to, to give us an update on where things stand with the uh, change in the debt limits next uh, March. So again, thanks very much. I think it was a really uh, informative uh, program. I wanna thank everybody else who was on the webinar today uh, for attending. Uh, as always, a survey link is going to be emailed out following this program and we really uh, would appreciate your feedback uh, as we move forward with uh, planning our events. Um, please note in your calendars, our next virtual event will be held on May uh, 20th. So look for uh, emails uh, to come out on that uh, here in the near term. So again, thanks everybody for being here. Thanks to our panel uh, for what they brought uh, today. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, bye.